Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstores Virtual Event Series. My name is Noah Mitz. I'm the store's event coordinator, and Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years of business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to welcome Fernando Flores for the release of his new excellent story collection, Valley-esque, in conversation with Raul Castillo. Now to some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, you can click the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. Uh, if you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. One caveat for tonight's uh, event is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. And there is a chat box to which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. Um, we have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring. So do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is next Wednesday, May 11th. We're thrilled to welcome Sheila Hetty and illustrator Esme Shapiro in person for a garden party in celebration of their new kids picture book, A Garden of Creatures. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. We hope you'll come by if you're in town. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Fernando Flores was born in Reynosa, Tamaulipas, Mexico and grew up in South Texas. He's the author of the collection Death to the Bullshit Artists of South Texas and the novel Tears of the Truffle Pig, which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and named a best book of 2019 by Tor.com. His fiction has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books Quarterly, American Short Fiction, Plowshares, Freeze, Porterhouse Review and elsewhere. He lives in Austin, Texas. And Raul Castillo is an actor across the film, television, and theater mediums. He is best known for his portrayal of Paps in the critically acclaimed independent feature, We the Animals, based on the Justin Torres novel of the same name and directed by Jeremiah Zager, which brought him an Independent Spirit Award nomination, and for his starring role as Richie in the Michael Lannan-created groundbreaking HBO series, Looking, which ran for two seasons before wrapping up with a telefilm. Born and raised in McAllen, Texas, Castillo studied theater at Boston University School of Fine Arts, and he currently resides here in Brooklyn, New York. So now without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Noah. I, think, you. Uh, I think the closed captioning means we can't uh, mumble, uh, Fernando. <laughs> That's going to be harder. That's going to be a harder one. I know, right? For, for bilingual Mumbra. kids. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, tell me about it, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for being here, Raul, and for, uh, for you know, celebrating the book launch here with Community Bookstore. Absolutely. I highly appreciate it. Thank you, everybody at Community Bookstore and everybody who is joining us here this evening. It's taken time out of all the crazy things happening in this world to be here tonight and share this evening. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome to be here, man. It's awesome. Congratulations on the launch of the book, man. Um, Thank you so much. Thank really, you so really, much. really exciting to to see it happen. I love when I, I got an early, I got to get an early copy of that you sent me, and you know, I love seeing your name on on you know on that paperback, and it's exciting, man. Thank really. you so much. You know, to be a paperback writer, what a dream. You know, <laughs> when I was uh, when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, so uh, so. Uh, you know, I was going to start this evening by uh, reading one of the stories, and I would thought to start by reading the first story in the collection. You know, uh, in many ways, I think it's like the weirdest story in the collection. I almost didn't put it in the book, you know, because uh, I thought it was too strange, you know, and I was like, I, I took it out of there, and then I looked at the manuscript, and I didn't quite, I thought it was too, you know, so I was like, I don't know, I put, so I'm like, if I'm going to put this weird story, I'm, I'm going to put it in as the first story, you know, that way to get it out of the way. The that way of my editor, when my editor reads it, like, he'll just, you know, or whoever, like, he'll read it and they'll be like, okay, this, this story is weird as hell. Hopefully they're not all like these or whatever. So I think this is like the weirdest story I've ever written. <laughs> I'll probably ever write in my whole career. And uh, here it is. It's called uh, Queso. Watching the news on television, Marcos yelled, that anchor's face ain't real, and hurled an empty glass. The glass bounced off the TV screen and curiously neither shattered. Pissed as hell, he walked to the kitchen and brushed his teeth over the sink. 
It rained as he got on the bus and Marco scanned his found student ID that let him ride for free. At the job interview, the general manager asked him to describe his talents and ambitions in the most creative, non-misogynist way and explain why she should give him the job. Marco said to her, Willie was the only other Mexican in East, in East Kingsville. And one day he held a red ripe orange to a butcher's nose and made him describe the smell of the motherland on his fingers. The butcher was also Mexican of no relation. Very good, said the general manager, marking off a box in her notes. Now here at this job, we are a tightly knit community. On a scale of one to 10, how will you describe your collaboration with others upon encountering a tough situation? Well, first you wring the neck of the big turkey to let flops. Then you make a soup from the rest and feed it to the others, slowly watching the meat, greedily offering them more water and more bread. Wait until afterward to bring up their sisters in the war. Excellent, Mr. Marcos. And using the same scale of one to 10, tell me something you think you could improve either in your work ethic or personal integrity. There's nothing safer than a shark to ride. Tape notes under the table. I'll learn the ropes, the insides and outsides of this trade. Just give me the chance and I'll have a mind for the books and how to make money disappear. Piles will wheelbarrow out the back or from the bottle and you'll never even know. Then I'll bring the horses in and forget about it. Give me the pies, give them. All right, Mr. Marcos, looks like we've got what we need. Thank you so much for the opportunity to interview you. We'll get back to you by the end of the day. When the boss read the application, he thought out loud to himself, all I want is to have a place where anybody can just walk right in and order a bowl of melted cheese. And we'll throw in some spices for flavor. They'll be served with hardened broken tortillas. Chips, we'll call them. And people can dip the hardened tortilla chips into this melted cheese when they're having a good time. We'll call the cheese queso. Not pronounced Mexican, but queso. The trick I've learned from the best is that you got to co-op their culture, hijack it, and sell them back a cheaper version. An authentic experience that's faster, better than the real thing. We'll also make our version of what they call breakfast tacos and serve them round the clock. To save time, the tortillas will be pre-made, possibly purchased in bulk and at a discount from a provider. The eggs, they had to be already cracked in a container and poured on the grill upon getting ordered. This touch is important. It is what will let us advertise them as fresh. Every taco will also come sprinkled with cheese. Unless otherwise specified, the standard is that every taco will be topped off with this cheese, American, and just shredded over but pre-shredded also. The American cheese will have to be pre-shredded. Yes, that goes without saying. And this young man, he's gonna be the one grilling them. We'll start him on the graveyard shift and take it from there. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh man, that was so great. Oh man. It's great to hear you read your own work, dude. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's weird to read and not have like somebody in the audience you look at and they're like, <laughs> you know, and they're like, I don't know. And you're like, all right. Or you know, you're like, I'm done, I guess, you know, so. so. I, I laughed my ass off when I read that uh, short story the first time and then again the second time, man. I was, I and I, then I kind of knew you know, you, you set the tone. You, I knew what I was in for. I knew I was in for a ride. 
uh, which and it was it was a trip rereading it because the first time I didn't know what just happened, <laughs> and I think the the second time I, I read it I can uh, I can appreciate I, I I don't know I just appreciated the humor of it. Um, what was the uh, I, the first thing I wrote down when because I, I reread the book to kind of prepare for today, and and one of the things that I, you know I wrote was like what was the inspiration for this story in particular. Uh, <laughs> I think I was I was unemployed. Like I was unemployed. There was a while when I was unemployed, and I kept having job interviews, and I kept hating them. You know, I kept hating job interviews, and I was and I had to ride the bus bus back home. You know, mm. and uh, I was so mad, and I just sat down and I wrote like like gibberish. I was just writing gibberish, you know, and also like I have a friend of mine. You know, I have a very a friend of mine who's very. Uh, you know, very esoteric. He's kind of a genius anyway. Mm. And he used to work at City Hall. And he told me this anecdote of one day when he was kind of like having a bad day, a bad morning, he got to go work at City Hall. And he, when he walked right in, and the way he described it was like, everybody just sounded like gibberish. Everybody's words were, it sounded like words, but they weren't really words. And then they look, he look over there and somebody was doing the same thing, you know, mm. almost like in being John Malkovich when everybody's like John Malkovich and you're like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that was, so that's what all these, all these things together. I just wanted to write something completely incomprehensible to, I never really try to do it and naturally and but also capture something capture like a mood and capture a feeling because i don't really believe in like writing like for the sake of writing or being weird for the sake of weird i'm never like weird for the sake of like i'm just gonna do this because you know i'm because i can you know like i always yeah, i try to have some kind of reasoning behind it and right and uh, work with it, you know. To to me, the fun thing is to work to work with it and make it work, you know. Yeah. But, but I realize also to have a piece that is that that is like that. Like I can't write. Like I can't imagine writing a like. Can you imagine like reading a whole book that is like that? You're like like Finnegan's Wake or something. Like you could do it, but it'll drive you like crazy, you know. <laughs> so, so I wanted to do that also with like the van, in the sense of like you know Texas, South Texas. You know, I never really see that kind of uh surrealism and weirdness not so much in like also in like the ways laid out on the page you know the way the dialogue is and i was interested in moving a story forward with this incomprehensible like gibberish about capitalism you know mm, mm. That to me like it sounds like like and that's what these things like sound like to me like these very like in the end these very official like sounding like barriers and things right like sound like gibberish like if like somebody like who doesn't know like a space alien who witnesses this like i don't know like it's weird uh gibberish that you just make up to create barriers for people i guess you know what absolutely. i mean absolutely i love that you uh when you when you pronounce the title you you called it queso. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think, you know, in, like you're you're calling in right now from where, your home in Austin and you've lived in Austin for many years. Like me, you're from the real Grand Valley from, you know, with roots from Reynosa and like you've lived in Austin a bunch of years and queso is such a, it's such an Austin thing. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I thought that theme was really powerful, especially in the second time I read it, like about when the manager says about uh about taking the, the culture and like you know uh, yeah. yeah thank you so much yeah yeah sometimes when i you know i meet people from la or whatever and they say like oh, cheese i just we just play cheese over there you know yeah, yeah so i just if you want like just really cheese or whatever yeah. yeah queso i always make sure to say queso like sometimes you know even like you know, i speak like in, you know one time i read that did I read, I think one time I read it in San Antonio, that story, or maybe not, I don't know. But there were a few Mexican, Mexican American people in the audience who, and I'm like, you know, I'm still gonna call this queso because that's the name of the story. You know, it's not queso. I yeah, mean, of course. It's not queso. And then they just, <laughs> you know, like, oh, you know, I'm not. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, went to, I went to college in Boston and then my brother lived in Austin and, 
and I was I was still kind of a Valley kid. And I remember him going queso and Guadalupe and like, you know, saying things like that. And I was like, why are you pronouncing them like that? We know how to say them correctly. Like, but it's such an Austin Central Texas kind of like, you know. Uh, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. They, they done. Yeah. They they done their own version, their own things with the Spanish language here. You know? Yeah. And then, yeah. and then the way that they, that cheese is just thrown on Mexican food in in the, in the United States. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Just throw cheese on. Just throw cheese all over it, inside of it. Yeah. You know, around <laughs> it. You know. Right like, on. Cheese oh, yeah. inside the cheese. You know. How can yeah, man. Cheese inside the cheese. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's how. That's the. That's so. That's kind of like what I'm. I guess I don't want to say making fun of because that's not really what I am trying to do but i guess cap i was trying to like capture in this esoteric way like when you write you know i'm sure you know like when you're creating things that just come out you know absolutely absolutely how so how long did it take you to write this um, book i mean i know you know just to contextualize for people it's like you know you had tears of the truffle pig before this which was your debut novel and then that's the bullshit artist before that which is short stories when did you start writing this batch of Short stories. You know, this, I, you know, in many ways, this is my most deliberate book because mm. I really paid attention to the way it, not only for the first time ever, I thought about the reader, first of all, the experience of the reader doing it, you know, so this, this book, the span of this book takes place 10, pretty much 10 years, you know, uh, the earliest published story came out in 2010. And that's the story called April 29th, the 29th of April yeah uh which is also like the uh like an, an experience within itself that story you know that's and totally beautiful man thank I mean, you that's yeah. another one story that i wondered if i wrestled with the idea of putting it in or not you know and i i left it in there and i ended up working and i was i'm happy that it did why why did you why did you wrestle with it because I felt that my the style of writing had changed too much you know i feel that this this collection really captures like my writing really changing and mm. like i wrote and truffle pig really really captures a lot of that really a lot of my writing changing but in this one you can see it happening like gradually having I mean, like there's a story here that takes place in ciudad juarez that yeah um, the main character is frederick chopin the pianist yeah. And obviously, Frederic Chopin never lived in Ciudad Juarez. I, I googled it just to see. <laughs> so, uh, yes, but it was the first time I wrote that. I, I wrote the first page of that story like in 2011. And I had a roommate at the time. Who, and my roommate didn't really read. He wasn't really a big reader. Uh, but you know, one time, but he'd get, he'd get drunk and I'd write him in the living room. My typepad was right there. He'd get drunk and sometimes he'd read my pages and I didn't even know this until he'd like tell me. But one day, years later, years later after I stopped living with him, I ran into him in the street and he was kind of drunk too. He's like, oh man, that Chopin story, the Chopin. He told me he never forgot it. He told me he never uh -huh. forgot it. And I never, and I hadn't finished that story. That story was a page long, you know? So I was like, this toy is too weird. I don't know what to do with it. And then I just forced myself to finish it. A lot of big things really happened in my life. Like my mother passed away. And so I had all these really feelings about death and mourning. And so I really wanted to really do something with all these things. And I finally finished the story. And it was the first time I really tried to do something. It's totally, totally, it's completely strange. Even that was even strange to me, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that story made me like I didn't expect to get emotional, uh, but but it did make me emotional. It was like it hit Thank you, court. thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I've heard that reaction mm -hmm. several times from people, and even myself. While I was reading it out loud, and there's a certain sequence in there where I found myself myself like experiencing like weird emotional feelings and stuff like that. But but it was sort of like but so I feel that this this. This collection really captures story it captures really stories like like half of it i wrote between 2018 and 2020 i want to say six of those stories were wrote, written in that in, in that uh, uh and the other six were written were plucked from the from that era from between 2010 and 2020 and i had more short stories that i kind of that i i, I tinkered with putting in and 
I tinkered with the the format of, with the order of the story. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the really the way the the way it's laid out is really the way I presented it to to my editor and my agent and everyone. And cool. I'm surprised. I was surprised. I was like, you know, it worked. I guess it works as a narrative, as a visual yeah. narrative. You know, like yeah. a mixtape almost. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Like when a band's putting a record together, I bet they like there's a lot of conversation around how they, you know, lay out the tracks and. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and I thought about you know the the you know the, I like some rock and roll records like for example for the, like the Jimi Hendrix records like they always start with like a one minute mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. one and a half minute song that is totally. like noise like noise and then he comes in with the second track is like the rock you know yeah so I want to kind of like. So that's why that first story there is the first story to kind of set the tone and to yep. get the, to get the noise and to get all of that avant-garde stuff like out of the way. And then in the second story, I kind of try to like bring in the rock, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is the, the second one is uh... is the science fair protest. Oh, that, yeah. The strange yeah. story about neighbors, you know. Yeah. Somebody pointed out to me that I that, you know, that I, there's a few stories here about neighbors and about interacting with neighbors. And I thought that was interesting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about, cause it's funny you mentioned that, that one that April, April, um, the 29th of April, uh, because when I read that, uh, my family, you know, is from Reynosa. Uh, I was born in McAllen, but we still lived in Reynosa when I was born. And, and, you know, it's half of my family is over there and half came over and, you know, like you, we, we grew up kind of back and forth a lot. And when I read that story and you mentioned Los Charcos, which is very like that just resonated. I was like, that's, I, I, I don't think I've been to Los Charcos, but, but my parents spoke of it, you know, and, and, and it, 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 and there's other kind of references in that story that made me think you never call it, you never refer to Reynosa. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, well, a, like there's a title Valley ask, right. Um, and and place in your in your in your writing because truffle pig is very much you know fictitious McAllister right is the name of the of uh, uh, of instead of McAllen or you know that's yeah, that's yeah, how I take yeah. it at least and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, sometimes 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 we're what I'm guessing is in Austin uh, sometimes we're in the valley sometimes we're in what I'm guessing of Reynosa you know um, sometimes. And then, and then we jump over to Juarez, like in, in that story that you just mentioned. So I just wanted to talk, I wanted to ask you about like, yeah, about look, a place and like, you know, the, the valley as a as a literary theme in general and like the border and Texas and, and uh, how you, when you start a story, like, is it in, like, is it an intellectual choice or like, you know, when where you're going to set it or, you know, I guess every story is different, but I would imagine you 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 toy with that a lot. Uh, yes, definitely. You know, yeah, the title, you know, to me, I was really, you know, I really wanted to have a story. I've always, like, you know, when I was younger, I really, really thought the idea, like the idea of having a title that is a made up word, you know? Mm. So, you know, so Valley-esque, you know, was just a word that just came to me. I'd never seen it anywhere. I never heard anybody say it. So to me, yes, it's this, it's, it's a, it, it is a huge, it's like 60, 40, 70, 30, maybe like it's setting and feeling too, you know, almost like we use the word like Kafka-esque or Fellini-esque, you know, yeah. I think it's Fellini-esque and you know exactly what it is, you know, you know exactly what it means. It's a feeling, it, you don't necessarily think that it's Italian or that it's, you know, Kafka, you don't necessarily think that it's like from Prague. Right. But it's like a feeling of like weirdness, you know. So, mm. yeah. So you so a lot of these stories take place in like different settings and stuff like that. But what binds them is like this feeling, this and this word that this that word that is valley esque to me is still a word that is taking shape. I'm still myself unsure what it really means, valley esque. And I think that the book designer, not Kim, who mm. who is a genius, and every. I am in awe of every book that not Kim has ever designed, but I think she really managed to capture that feeling with this amazing psychedelic cover, you know? Yeah, it's beautiful. 
Yeah. So, so yeah. So to me, it's like, it's mostly feeling and to me, like, cause to me, like, I think I was also thinking about like Dostoevsky or like, you know, we never say like, or like James Joyce or something like, like is James Joyce trying to be Irish or is he trying to mm. or like Dostoevsky? We never think like Dostoevsky, like, oh, just actually trying to be like, you know, is he thinking about, you know, setting a story in like like St. Petersburg or something? Like to me, like, so I think about whenever I think that I'm maybe I'm writing too much about this area or something, because I can't help myself sometimes, you know, I don't. Every time, whenever I start a story, I never say I'm going to do this. I never have a plan that I'm going to do this. You know, it just mm. happens. It just sort of happens. I was born in Reynosa. I lived there till I was, my family moved to Alton, Texas when I was five years old. And I lived there till I was 23. And next year actually will be my 18th year in Austin. And I lived 18 years in the Valley, you know, and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. So uh, and I, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I am uh, I'm coming up on 20 years in New York City and I left McAllen when I was 17. Um, wow. And so I've now lived, out, you know, I've now lived in New York. Wow. Ago. So I'm curious about your relationship to the Valley, to the border, to Reynosa, like having lived in Austin as long as you've lived. and how often you get back, like, um, and how your writing has evolved, you know? So, uh, yeah. You know yeah, you know, I haven't visited, I don't visit that much anymore. You know, it's hard for me, you know, as I, I'm going to be 40 here uh, next month. And, you know, uh, I, I only have like a few acquaintances down the valley, you know, now a few friends, very, very good friends, you know, very, very good friends that I cherish very much. Uh, and I see, I'm lucky enough to see them, you know, up here in Austin, you know, I would love to go to the Valley and have a, you know, fun reason to go to the Valley and like take photographs. I would love to go down there for photography or for something like that. If I had like a project going, you know, Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I do, but I think about, I know I, I always try to, you know, seek out the, uh, I've always seeked out the artist, the art that comes from that region, you know. I always want more writers to come from the Valley, you know, yeah. particularly more women novelists. I wish there was more of a foundation or something for more, uh, more mm. writers to have opportunities that come from, come from the South Texas, you know, Absolutely. Uh, you know, cause I really, I really, you know, when I growing up down there, you know, there was no independent bookstores down there really growing up that I can think of. There was this, there was this thing called Hastings. Do you remember Hastings? Yeah, on yeah. Street? yeah. That's when we'd go, you know, people sold you, they sold you CDs and stuff like that. Hastings. I think it was just this Texas chain. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah. Was, was there a bookstore in the mall, I think too, or something like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a Walden books in the mall. Before, you know, before, uh, before Barnes and Nobles came in and all that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Now there's a Barnes and Noble on Nolana and 10th Street. I think there's an, another one, like another part of McAllen. Which that's a, that's an interesting thing, dude. Sorry to cut you, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like like you know we grew up, you know pre-internet days and and being and I always talk about this because being from the valley, like <clears throat> what you were influenced by, what you know you were limited to what you to what you had. Now you have you can Google anything, you know you can music whatever. But oh. when we you know when we were growing up, it was like it, it, there was very little access. So I'm like curious, like. You know, a broader, broader question is like how you got into writing, like when you knew you wanted to be a writer, like who are your early influences? Like, uh, you know, yeah. When, when did it start uh, for you? Like as a kid, is it, you know? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Uh, you know, when I was a teenager, I was lucky enough to get super hardcore into film and to cinema, you know? Uh, the American Film Institute in the mid '90s released their hundred best movies of all time, and in high in high school, when I was I was in high school in ninth grade or something, and I printed out the list and I tried to rent the movies as much as possible. You know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine recently, and I was like, "Okay, it's 1998, and you want to watch Breathless by Godard, and you live in McAllen, <laughs> all right? Let's say you're living in McAllen in 1998, you want to watch Breathless by Godard. How do you do it? What are you gonna do?" Go, start, 
And I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, what do I do? You know, I think what I would do, I get I get somebody to order for me on the Internet or some, on VHS if it exists. It's probably like 30, 40 dollars on VHS in 1998, you know? Right. You know? Right. And I work a part time job and I did that, you know? So uh, so I, uh, I became interested, like I read like about screenwriting and about, you know, uh, and I became interested in a screenwriting structure and I write, wrote screen screenplays, you know? And then I just naturally saked into like writing books. Eventually I became interested in storytelling in general, you know? And cinema has always played a cinema and cinematic story, like storytelling has always played a great influence in my, my work even, you know, there's cinemas, ref, ref, like just fake movies sometimes in my work, you know? <laughs> and like, and like in the mid, in the, like when I first moved to Austin, like in 2005, you know, like you say, you say this thing about access, I finally, you know, I got a, I got a, I, I, I went to I Love Video. I got a video card from I Love Video. You know, you know all about I, I Love Video. I went to Spider House, I, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where you get a film education, really. That's where Hell you yeah. get educated, right? Definitely. That and, and Vulcan Video, that was just like across yep. the street from it, pretty yep. much. You know? Totally. So I just rent all these movies, you know, and, and I got into the habit of, of watching like the director's commentary, especially in like and. Francis Ford Coppola's movies, especially, you know, and I watch every one, you know, mm. every one. He has so much wisdom to dispense, you know, so much. You know, one of the things that always stays with me was uh, how after his father, Car his father, I think Carmine Coppola is his name. He composed the original music to The Outsiders. And oh, wow. uh, at the time, he really, uh, Coppola really wanted it to sound like Gone with the Wind. He was like, Gone with the Wind. I wanted it to look like Gone with the Wind. I wanted it to sound like Gone with the Wind. And he was, in the end, he was, he didn't like his father's score in the end, but he put it in the movie anyway. <laughs> but anyway, in the version that you watch, that you watch, he, uh, he took out his father's score. He put in a brand new score. He talks about how bad he feels, <laughs> but he waited until his father passed away to do it, you know? Oh my God. Wow. I, know, I did not know that story. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I, you know, to me, that's like a fascinating thing, you know, to regret this thing about this movie. You wait until your father passed away and completely replace the score of this movie and recut it, you know? <laughs> Like things, little things like that about storytelling, you know, that affect, I guess, what I try to do, you know, that I try to bring out, you know. So, so yeah, somebody like in 2005, somebody gave me a typewriter and I just started writing stories, you know. I, I got hired to work at a kitchen at a restaurant to be a dishwasher and I just space out for like eight hours just washing dishes. Mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the story, thinking about the stories I was going to write when I would get home and I'd get home and I just write it, write the stories, you know, mm. so I became obsessed with this, you know, and I became obsessed with border, reading as much as many border writers as possible. I read all pretty much all of them by now that I could find. Uh, and I noticed that mostly most uh, literature that comes from South Texas is this like is very stark and very like realist. And I asked myself, like, why write anything? You know, why sh there, there more books exist now than the history of humankind. You know, why write anything? So, so you know, I don't try to write, you know, if it's something that I, so that's what I was getting at with Francis Ford Coppola, you know, we, he said something that really changed my life where he said that, you know, he never works on a movie unless only he can bring that movie to life, you know? Like he, somebody, presented him with a script to a movie that I think is called 13 Days Later or something like that about the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is like 20 year old, 20 years ago. And uh, he passed on the movie. They offered him to direct it, you know, and the movie ended up being a movie and it was a, it was a fine movie, he said, but the movie still existed without his, without his, you know, having to work on it, you know. So I always think about that. I'm like, what can I do that only I can do, you know? Yeah. Like I could write a story about, you know, my family moving to this country, you know, and all that stuff. But but there's already very powerful and very many uh, books that do that. You know, why why try to do, rewrite a story that already exists, you know? Yeah. So I try to explore new territory or if I am going to write a story like this, I try to approach it in a way that nobody that nobody that I've never seen anybody do it before. You know, can I can I read a little passage? Please do. Oh my yeah. God, I would love it if you did. Because I, I, I 
I circled this bit from a, a story called Nostradamus Baby, please, which, is, which is a great, great story. And I, th I think it touches on what you're uh, speaking to. Um, this is the narrator speaking. It, um, he says, as I walked away, I felt a creative emptiness that took me back to the early days when I was young and dreaming of having a body of work, but hadn't yet written a single page I was happy with. Things felt futile now. And glancing once more at the newspaper headlines, I could see how nothing could outdo these real life absurdities, but perhaps living in a society where realism is the reigning literary form renders that society powerless against its own absurdity. Strange stories had helped me give meaning to the painful moments of survival. And strange stories were the only things I could continue feeding into the machine. Um, I thought I was really taken by that. Um, uh, wow, thank you. Yeah, yeah, man. That's like, and it's thank kind you. of speaking to what you're talking about right now. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's just like why, why, why be creative if you're not going to be, you know, if you're not going to try to do, find your own voice or, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. It's too painful and it's too hard, you know. Yeah. Uh, in, in many ways, it is, you know, and. Uh, so I try to, you know, I try to be hard on myself. I don't know. I know that people are out there going to be harder, than, <laughs> harder on you than you, you know, yeah, so I sure. try to anticipate that, you know, so, yeah. you know, what I do is very, very deliberate and I'm happy with what I do regardless of, you know, other, other takes on stuff because, you know, I, I know that I'm ultimately very, very hard on myself, you know, mm -hmm. and I guess producing work that only I could produce, you know. Absolutely. So thank How, you for that observation. I'm I'm really blown away by that. Thank yeah, you. I was really moved by by reading it, man. Uh, what um, do you, you're an avid reader? I I know that from like you know from just conversations with you and like, um, are there? I'm just curious about like, you. It's interesting that you that film led you to. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to writing, uh, but I'm curious if, you know, if you could speak to like literary influences or, you know, um, I, yes. I, I love that you read all that, all the border stuff. Uh, cause I was very curious too, as a, as a young artist about other border artists. Uh, yeah, I know you were. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we first met, we talked about a few things we were trying to read like border literature at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, tr you know, when I was in my early 20s, I tried to read every like canonical American author that I could, that I had heard of, you know, uh, when I, in McAllen, inside the downtown bookstore, the bookstore that was on Main Street, and I mean, not the bookstore, I'm sorry, the public library on Main Street. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. McAllen, they had a little tiny bookstore in there called the Friends of the Library Bookstore. Yeah. And they, their books would be like a dollar. Sometimes you'd find like brand new books that were a dollar. That's, you know, when I first found like the, I first found that like the corrections by Jonathan Franz in there for like a dollar, like just after it had come out, I was like, oh my God, I got it. You know, I was like 19 or however old I was when that came out. So I tried to read everything that I thought, you know, was canonical. And also like in this little bookstore, I find anthologies, you know, anthologies of like American literature, and I read as many as possible and I read them from cover to cover, you know, and I find that a lot of the stories were like repet, were the same stories. And uh, so, you know, some of my, but you know, uh, okay, like you say the thing about film, one day I saw the first part of the movie, uh, An Angel at My Table, which is a Jane Campion movie about the writer, Janet Frame. And it's a writer who I had never heard of. And I went, and, uh, at the time I was working at the university as an audio video technician and I didn't really have a library card. So, uh, but I would go to the library at the university and I, and I found that they had a copy of Janet Frame's short stories. Is that Pan American? At the UTPA, what was at the, at the time UTPA, you know, I found <laughs> it and, and I read some of the, one of the short stories, I think it's called The Reservoir, The Log Lagoon. But the story was about how you know there's this like like a lagoon or a reservoir and there's like a, this thick pipe that runs across you know and it was about how her how her and her sisters and her friends in the neighborhood uh uh would some of the older kids would like walk across to the other side 
of the lagoon and they tease other kids into crossing and sometimes kids would like it become like a rite of passage thing for kids you know <laughs> and it reminded me and me growing up in Alton you know me and some of the neighborhood kids would do this very same thing at a canal where this pipe would happen wow so I read the story and for the first time ever like I had a connection with like literature I was like 19 years old you know I had this connection with a writer I'd never heard of she's from New Zealand and the way she depicts little kids was like in this savage way that was very believable to me and I had never seen anybody depict like Mexican American kids I grew up with in this way you know and I to me it was very profound and moving that I experienced that with this writer I'd never heard of you know right and I had a similar experience also with another writer named John Fante. Oh, yeah. John Fante, who's an Italian American writer who wrote a collection called The Wine of Youth. And the same, he wrote stories about being first generation Italian American, you know, his parents are from Italy, you know, he wrote right, he wrote about his conflicts, his, you know, his issues he had with his own Italianism, you know how much he wants to be an American, you know, and his first novel, uh, the Ask the Dust, uh, is a super short little novel. He's like a really arrogant and a really kind of an asshole character, really. But he falls in love with like a Mexican waitress, you know? Oh, yeah. And it was the first time, and this book was written in the 30s. I never heard of it. And for me to discover this book, to me, the language that he used was very like progress, like very progressive and very like also like, uh, very vile, very vile and punk rock, mm. which is mm. what I liked at the time, you know, I was like, oh my God, it was like some punk rocker kid wrote this, you know, you know, and I, it had all these themes, like I said, like the, he falls in love with a Mexican waitress. I never seen like, I never seen, and I, and I never seen her depicted, I never seen a character like that depicted in literature, you know, mm. she was so believable and she's also so punk rock, you know, so these were two big influences in my life that I read when I was like between the ages of 19 and 21. And I'm like, oh my God, these, these things really spoke to me and my experience growing up in the Valley. And I was like, I've never read anything like, anything that is vicious, that is so vicious and so profound and so beautiful, you know, yeah, and so yeah. hilarious, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I became obsessed with finding like, unknown writers like this after i read like all the canonical books you know like all all the big russian books and james joyce and virginia wolf and the tony more tony and you know tony morrison and james baldwin uh and even like unknown writers like genaro gonzalez or john philip santos you know sandra cisneros you know florian mm -hmm. saldua mm -hmm. i was like i started looking for these unknown writers you know and tried to bring these things that they do to the stories that I was trying to tell and was trying to convey. I get, I don't know. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah. I got to meet uh, Gloria Saldua when I was in college. Um, oh, awesome. At, at BU, we used to have, um, oh, wow. Well, there was a thing called the East Coast Chicano Student Forum. And, and uh, during Thanksgiving, because a lot of us were from the Southwest and we couldn't afford to go home, like they would have this thing called a pachanga where, you know, they would bring in people uh you know to you know they had you know platicas and all kinds of things and and uh she was she came and spoke to us and and it was it was cool to meet someone from the valley who had written you know so like that's badass that's a yeah. badass yeah, yeah that's a know. great experience yeah to meet uh, you know to be from the valley at the, to me at the time you know and to think about artists you know and you're like oh my god like i don't know to me to hear from anybody who was from the valley at that time who was like an artist to me i like worship these people you yeah know? Man. like you know filmmakers like jim and diola who i heard, heard yeah, yeah, yeah you know and i watched you know a bootleg of his movie and to me like this was like oh my god like it was like a mothership landing it was like yeah. wow this is you know something is happening out there you know so I, you know i really try to do something with this energy throughout my life you know yeah yeah it really speaks to the value of like being able to identify with the stuff you see on tv and the stuff you read in books and you know like when you see yourself like you said about that character in ask the dust i think, I think that's so fascinating when i when i was uh at mccallan high school um 
I found a copy of Miguel Pinero's plays oh, and, yeah. and, and, and the, the New Yorican Poets Cafe, which is, you know, very different than my, my experience in the Rio Grande Valley. They're, you know, they're writing about the Lower East Side of New York and, but it resonated for me and it had, and it influenced me and it, and it, and it made me want to write. It made me want to get on stage. And, you know, I think that that's really important and I'm excited for people to, discover Valley-esque and discover your writing and, you know, for it to be out there, and, you know, for you to have a, to have, Thank you. That's you know. the ultimate, thank you. That's the ultimate compliment in the way, you know, if some, somebody, you know, somebody just finding your work and having that mean something to you, anything, you know, it's so difficult to just get a little bit of attention in this, in this frail world, you know? So I'm <laughs> grateful for, uh, I'm grateful for readers and people who believe like in art and literature, you know, and, yeah. you know, and who also, you know, organize and do important things out there that need to be done, you know? Yeah. I mean, cause even like, you know, you, you, the, the, the book is, you know, surreal and the stories are, have different, you know, it, you know, kind of, uh, energies to them um but even like I, you know the science the science for a protest when i was reading that i was just thinking about like and i don't know if this is what you were thinking about when you wrote it but i was thinking about like the current kind of attack on education that's going on right now and i was like because the science for a protest is like deals you know a little um it's fictitious but it, but it just it made me think about what's you know the state of the current state of things um, yeah yeah thank you you know that's i think that's one of those things you know that you just accidentally like stumble upon. I think that's one of the, these things I like about connecting with the unknown or trying to write with not really having an exact plan with writing that you end up connecting with these themes happening in the world, you know, that yeah. will keep happening. That's has something like that happened to me when I was writing Truffle Pig and I wrote the two border walls and the third border wall being created. You know, I wrote that before you know, before the 16 election even started rolling, you know, and all of a sudden everybody was talking about the border wall and I was like, oh my God, I don't know how this happened, but, you know, but all of a sudden I have this book, you know, that deals with these themes that are happening. So I think that sometimes, you know, I don't know, if I think if you pay attention to the things going on in the world, that these things seep into your work, you know, because I think you can't help it, right? Because you can't ignore everything going on and even especially if you're a storyteller right sometimes you you know you have to grapple with these things and hopefully something something of value comes out you know that's what you hope yeah. for in the end you know yeah absolutely yeah what are, your, what are your writing habits dude what do you like how how often do you write what do you what's your like what's your do you have a do you have a ritual yeah, you know, when I wrote Truffle Pig, I wore the same shirt every time that I would wear it. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. It ended up tearing by the end, and I wore the same shirt every time. I don't know why I was like, I got to write. When I stopped writing it, I, when I finished it, it took me three months to write it, and I read it. I, read, oh, I only put it on when I wrote it on the typewriter. <laughs> so, and it was something like this, but a little bit clearer. You know, it ended up just looking disgusting by the end and it becomes like it drives you to finish a book i'm like i gotta get rid of this thing because it stinks you know so i'm like i gotta finish this book and move on uh but you know i read like in my mid 30s or maybe early 30s like six years ago six seven years ago i read an interview with tom waits the musician tom waits when he talks about his uh his recording habits in the studio how they have changed how when he was younger he'd record his albums at night and go like late into the night recording you know but like as he's gotten older he does the opposite he gets up early and starts recording early mm. and by like one o'clock in the afternoon he's done and they're done for the day you have a whole day ahead of you right. so, I'm a, so i do that now now i'm like okay now i used to so when I was younger, I'd ride in, into the into the wee hours of the morning and night. And then slowly in the last five, six, five years or so, I've changed. And now I just write right in the right in the morning, get it out of the way. Mm. Get it out of the way. That way by like, even if I write 50 to 100 to 1,000 words or something, or 2,000 words if I'm lucky, and it's, and it's noon and I'm like, I'm done. I'm, I did my work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Tennessee Williams was a daytime writer. And then, and then he can get hammered at night, and like, you know, like. Yeah, totally. I think it's time for uh, see if people have any Q, any 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 questions. I don't know if anybody the Q, has any the Q and A section. Yeah. All right, here, all right. I guess I'll start with. I think I'm gonna. Um, um, I guess this is the top one. Uh, 
the first question is since you bring up cinema and screenwriting have you ever written a screenplay or could you imagine these stories on the screen you know as far as screenwriting my own work that is i've already read i'm like i'm i want somebody else to do it if they're gonna do it you know like somebody's working on the screenplay for tears of the truffle pig and i'm like do whatever you want and he actually figured out a way to tell the story that I would have never figured out if I would have done it. You know, he figured out the approach or the way to, and, and I was like, that's fantastic. I would have never come up with it. Yeah. So I trust that. I trust, you know, if somebody believes in, in your work and wants to adapt it, uh, I trust them to do it. And I'm trusting the, I'm trusting every, the people, anybody who wants to adapt one of my work, Jimmy Mendiola adapted one of the, that's the bullshit artist of South Texas short story. And I was like, Jimmy, do whatever you want, make it work. You know, I'm a big believer that the book and the, or the story and the movie are two different things and you gotta make them work in different ways, you know? So I'm like, Jimmy, do whatever you want. You can rewrite the story, however you want to make it work, but you, you have my blessing, you know? <laughs> And you know, and recently I had I wrote a screenplay last year, an original screenplay, and I revised it already so many times. I've been learning so much about screenwriting in the last year. More, I imagine you being a kid again because hmm. screenwriting has changed so much in the last, like I guess, like just like 10, 15 years. I found, you know, I guess because of uh, streaming, like the way to tell stories, you know. Uh, and I hadn't read, read a screenplay in a long time, you know, that wasn't you know so i've been learning about screenwriting trying to revise as much as possible and trying to get things tight trying to learn how to move stories forward differently like in cinema yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. oh very cool i think i found um uh years ago i found this printed papers and i was like I was reading them and it was a screenplay and, and, and this is like we're talking about 10 15 years ago and it felt like I had written it but I was like I know I didn't write this but it sounds like and I think it it, it was like it didn't have a title page but I think it was yours dude I still have them somewhere that's uh, hilarious yeah, yeah. yeah I mean you know back in the day like I said you'd like you find an artist and you just you know you hold on to them for dear life and yeah you were, you were one of these people whenever i'd write something i'm like i'm gonna just send this to Raul. hell yeah man see if, you see if he see if he has time to read it and and see if, and yeah. you always you're always so generous you'd always read everything you'd always respond with yeah. with so much enthusiasm you know i'm this kid and I, it always gave me so much hope and so much you know so much to to work for you know in those days and it meant a lot to me Right on. Yeah, I met you when you were 19, dude. Um, yeah, you did at an IHOP. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're the, putting them back old school style, smoke, smoking cigarettes indoors. <laughs> it had this beautiful smoking section oh, that yeah. was always like this. Like, I remember that. Holy shit. That's wow. Wow. It was um, like this, this little cave in these IHOP <laughs> that all these. Uh, all these artsy people from yeah, yeah, yeah. Island would hang out in. That's all we had at the time, dude. <laughs> all we had at the time, you grab onto it for dear life, you know, like I said, you know. Here's another question. Um, uh, how many drafts uh, did Queso undergo? You know, Queso is pretty much, I found the original, I found the original, it's one page, one typed page. I found the original version and the original title was queso and then colon a, a pissed off story <laughs> obviously that was the first thing that i edited out of there you know so uh but it's just just pretty much the first draft that's pretty much the all the stories all the stories even though they have a lot of my micro work within them you know at the sentence level all the stories are pretty much the way I first drafted them, you know, they just at the sentence level change along the way, you know, mm -hmm. but sometimes I just, since I write on a typewriter, sometimes I disclose information. Sometimes I'm writing and I realized that I didn't, I didn't disclose certain information and I put it like later on the page because I can't go back obviously. So when I put it into the computer, I forget this and I'll put things out of sequence. So that kind of stuff, that kind of arrangement, I had to like micro do here and there, you know, it's just, but none of the stories really, really required that much work. You know, I'm very, very grateful for my, you know, visionary genius editor, Jackson Howard, you know, who, you know, you know, un really understands what I'm trying to do 
I think, and we have my, you know, it gives me so much freedom and, you know, I have so much love for everybody, at, for Jackson and everybody at, you know, at MCD, FSG. There's a, there's a, I think, I think we're running out of time, but I just wanted to get a couple of questions that people asked before. Uh, and I'll, so there's two questions. Um, one of them is you're obviously thinking about your work in relation to other writers. And I'm wondering what you were reading when you wrote the stories in Valiesque or who are some of your influences? Or is there anything you avoid reading while you're writing? You know, I don't avoid reading anything while I'm writing. I think every every story is like different. To me, every story, I have to batch it a different way. I have to, you know, I have to create a new batch of stories in a different way. So, so every story is just different, I guess, you know, but if I'm thinking of like influences, to me, my influences, like maybe you don't really see them on the page. They're mostly like, like spiritual influences, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know, like to me, like Roberto Bolaño, when I was like in 2009, I read 2666, that mammoth book that takes place in a fictional border town. And that book really like changed my life. To me, that's like the Moby Dick of like border literature, you know, to hmm. me. And to me, it was mind blowing that this Chilean guy who probably never visited the border was able to capture the border in such a way. He put the whole history of the 20th century and every genre of literature and everything he could have possibly crammed into an 800 page book and on the border into this book. So to me, that's a huge influence on me trying to be as good as your influences, you know, trying to mm -hmm. be as good as the people who influence you, the people who made you want to be a creator, be a storyteller, because otherwise, like I said, why tell stories, you know, because yeah, it's too difficult of a road and every step along the way, you know, so you got to feel that you connect with some kind of deeper meaning, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Amanda Silas is asking, are you working on anything now that you're super excited about that you can share? Well, you know, I finished my, la my next novel. My next novel comes out and hopefully in 2022, in two years. Oh, I, finished that, I finished that last year. So my first draft, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting edits and hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully I didn't screw up. I don't have to, I didn't screw up that first draft too much. <laughs> you know, I have to do a lot of work. But I'm looking forward to it. It takes place. It's going to be my first non border novel, you know. To me, Valley S closes off my trilogy of border novels, you know, a trilogy. I'm like, all right, I can, I got it out of my system. I wrote about, I wrote about the border in my hometown in a trilogy. It's like an unofficial trilogy, but to me, it's like a trilogy of my, my, of my, you know, of where I, where I'm from, you know, so uh, my next novel is called Brother Bronte, Bronte, like the Bronte sisters, Emily Bronte. Uh, Brother Bronte, and it takes place actually just like a few hours north of the valley and, and three rivers. Oh, but snap. It, it takes place like 50 years from now, and three rivers is like this failed tech capital. That <laughs> now just like this abandoned city with a tech, with buildings that that were like abandoned, you know. I saw that like, that like Musk was like, somebody offered him like a ranch to start like Twitter in the middle of Texas, you know, I was oh like, oh my God. God. And I was like, oh my God, this happens in my book that's not, that has not out yet. Wow. You know, <laughs> wow. You know it's in a fictional city that, you know, <laughs> this happened, you know. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, whatever happens. Not not with the real life stuff, but with, the, with my novel and we'll see what happens. Sure. That's I'm awesome, man. That's exciting, dude. It's already in the works. So so I have like I have a bit of time. So hopefully uh, I can do more uh, cinema and more screenwriting work, which is what I'm trying to trying to be better at right now. Too. Yeah, man. Thinking also of the next novel. I think I, I also have my next the next thing I'm gonna write already in mind. That's awesome. Oh, we have so much to look forward to. I'm so excited. Um, thank you both so much for this fantastic conversation. Fernando Raúl, this was a, a true pleasure. I could listen to you talk about this stuff all night, but should probably let people go. Um, those of you at home, thanks so much for your very thoughtful questions. Yeah. Please consider purchasing a copy of Valiesque. It's fantastic from Community Bookstore or your local indie. And we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again for joining us. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Community Bookstore. Thank you, everybody who tuned in. Congratulations, Fernando. Thank you so much.